So it's a, a great honor for me to introduce uh, Dr. Joseph Hill, our keynote uh, speaker. Dr. Hill is uh, the chief of cardiology at UT Southwestern. He's the editor-in-chief uh, of uh, Circulation, the official journal of the American Heart Association. Dr. Hill has uh, contributed enormously uh, during his career to the field, uh, basic and translational to clinical. And uh, I think we are fortunate that in this inaugural ACURE uh, group conference, we have him address, uh, delivering the keynote uh, lecture. Uh, Dr. Hill. Uh, thank you, Stavros and, and organizers. This is a fabulous meeting. I've, uh, I've learned quite a bit this morning. And um, it's my honor and pleasure to, uh, to present to you some of my thoughts about the future of heart failure. That's what I was asked to speak about. And um, first, a bit of philosophy. You know, if you think about it in medicine, our, the holy grail in medicine is to cure a disease, thereby eliminating the associated morbidity and mortality. However, in reality, there are quite few diseases in internal medicine and in cardiovascular medicine that we actually cure. In the great majority of cases, we have settled for the next best thing, which is to transform an acute disease into a chronic disease that we manage progressively over a long period of time. Uh, when I went to medical school, there was a syndrome, I remember two lectures uh, when I was at Duke University, there were two lectures about a syndrome that was emerging in San Francisco and in Haiti that no one understood, but that your immune system shut down and it was a death sentence within weeks. That acquired immune deficiency syndrome had no etiology, people had no idea what was going on. But fast forward to now where HIV AIDS is a disease that has not been cured, but it can be managed for a long period of time. This is similar to what we see in, in heart disease. In the 1960s, Prior to the advent of the coronary care unit, in-hospital mortality from a myocardial infarction was 30%. In-hospital mortality with a nurse, a nurse station right in front of your, your room. Imagine what it must have been in your living room. Fast forward to the mid-70s with the advent of the CCU and associated things, defibrillation and so forth, hemodynamic monitoring, that in-hospital mortality was cut in half. Fast forward to the 1990s with the advent of antiplatelet therapy, thrombolytic therapy, PCI, and so forth. It was cut in half again. Now in 2016, it's been cut in half again. Most hospitals in the US, it's around 2 or 3% for in-hospital mortality. So spectacular successes in taming the acutely lethal manifestations, for example, here of, of myocardial infarction in the hospital. I'm going to quote Dr. Braunwald several times today. Here's a paper that he and Betsy Nabel published the decline in age-adjusted mortality since the 1970s from heart disease is spectacular. It is 75%, 75% for many reasons, including more knowledge about uh, blood pressure and cholesterol and lifestyle, but also all the advents that you see here with the advent of, of new therapies, new approaches, new devices, uh, new strategies. So we've had spectacular successes. 75% decline in age-adjusted mortality from cardiovascular disease. I will tell you in that same period for cancer, it has declined 10%. As a result, the many people who previously would have died are now going home with a heart that is injured. And you can see that the likelihood that in the 70s, the likelihood that you would go home and be free of heart failure was pretty good. In the 80s, it was worse. In the, seven, in the 90s, it was worse yet still. In other words, we've transformed an acutely lethal disease into one that we now call heart failure. So the likelihood that you would go home, thank goodness you were alive, but you went home with an injured heart. And we've seen a, a, a proportionate increase in the incidence and prevalence of heart failure. In fact, and again, in another piece from Dr. Braunwald, you can see that MI incidence and prevalence has decreased and concomitant with that, the, the uh, proportion of heart failure has increased. And that's what I'll talk a lot about today, that in many ways, I think the future of, of heart disease uh, is in heart failure. Despite those successes that we've seen, spectacular successes, heart disease remains the number one killer in our world. It's 
some people project that in the next several years it might fall to number two as cancer takes over the number one spot. But it's still the number one killer in our world despite these amazing successes that we've seen. And I'd like to explore some of the reasons behind that. So here I've listed some of the therapies, most of the therapies that are used uh, to treat heart failure over the last century. I will tell you that the dates that I've assigned some of these are, are approximate. But you can see that some things like sedation have been abandoned, bed rest has been abandoned for early ambulation and even encouraged physical activity, sodium restriction persists, digitalis remains, diuretics are much more effective these days. Then in, in the 60s and so forth, we started targeting precipitating causes and using more inotropic support. Later to that, uh, the, the therapies that we're all familiar with, beta blocker, ACE inhibitor, and so forth. And much of what we've talked about today have been these newer therapies that I've zoomed in on here, that the, um, the distinction between HEFPEF and HEFREF, and maybe even a middle zone or a recovering zone that people are talking about, uh, studying the genetic bases of heart failure, pharmacogenetic gene therapy, uh, Roger Hajar, who's a, a world leader in that, um, the role of uh, sacubitril, valsartan, and, and natriuretic peptides is emerging, even heart rate now with evabradine. Cell-based therapies have some potential, and of course, we've talked a lot about mechanical support. So going forward, I think some of these will continue to be uh, uh, oops, major, major areas of emphasis, and again, many leaders in the mechanical support field are here in the room today. So the point, one of the points I'd like to make is the heart is a remarkably plastic organ, more plastic than many of us sometimes recognize. The heart can grow under two different circumstances, under physiological circumstances such as exercise and pregnancy like this. I used to call this the Lance Armstrong heart, but now we know his heart growth was multifactorial. <laughs> and pathological or disease-related heart growth related to hypertension, infarction, and many of these other things. So far, we know about one signaling pathway that leads to this good heart growth, and at least a half a dozen pathways that lead to bad heart growth. This type of heart growth is purely good for you. The athleticism-associated uh, hypertrophy response is, is beneficial, whereas this type of heart growth is unequivocally bad for you. In fact, if the stress, uh, these disease-related stresses are persistent, this thick-walled ventricle thins into a narrowed, narrowed ventricular wall, the narrowed chamber dilates, and a syndrome of heart failure ensues, and both of these phenotypes are associated with uh, malignant ventricular arrhythmia. For sake of completeness, I'll remind you that the heart can atrophy under many surprisingly common situations. For example, on, in settings of unloading, such as a ventricular assist device or bed rest, the heart will shrink. Catabolic states like cancer, weightlessness, and other unloading state. If you're lying in bed, your heart shrinks 1% per week. If you're in outer space, your heart shrinks 1% per week. If you remember when the Apollo moonshot, when they came down in, those, in the capsule with the big parachutes and splashed down in the Pacific, you recall that the, the astronauts weren't able to stand up, but they had to be carried out horizontally. If you, some of you are old enough to remember this. Um, of course, a lot of that stems from their loss of volume from redistribution and so forth. But a, so, some component of that stems from the uh, ventricular atrophy response that uh, they endured. So that's why on the International Space Station, or to the extent people are talking about traveling to Mars, what you do, what they're doing is provoking physiological hypertrophy in order to counteract this atrophy response. Until recently, it was all done on an ERG machine which is both isotonic and isometric, and it is the sport that triggers the greatest physiological growth. But as I understand it now, they use a treadmill where they actually clamp you down onto the treadmill with a, with a shoulder harness so you stay on it and you run on, on the treadmill. So there are two types of heart growth, uh, the, this type of heart growth and atrophy response, and both of these are surprisingly large. The heart can grow about 50% under both physiological and pathological circumstances, and it can grow to the same extent in both contexts. It can shrink about 70%. For example, people who've suffered a spinal cord injury are relegated to permanent bed rest. Their heart will shrink down to about 70% of its former mass and stay there. We don't know why it, it stays there. But the total dynamic range of heart growth is greater than 100%, and it can do that quite rapidly. For example, in the postpartum period, a formerly pregnant woman, her heart will begin to lose the, the, the uh, hypertrophic response that occurs with pregnancy. Uh, patients who are, had an aortic valve replaced also have a regression of their hypertrophic response. 
Athletes who train competitively have a bigger heart during the training season than they do in the off season. So this growth response is both quite robust in magnitude and in, and in its kinetics. The triggers that elicit this from a disease-related context are shown here. This is the cardiac exposed zone, just focusing exclusively on the disease-related phenotype, where elevated afterload, elevated preload, neurohumeral events, and so forth. Um, today, I'm going to talk about, try to uh, illustrate uh, the dynamic plasticity of the myocardium, which I think is very relevant to the notion of, of mechanical circulatory support and unloading, uh, focusing on two. Um, first, um, whoops, I didn't, it's changed. I'm going to focus on, on pressure overload and show you some, some data, actually some data from uh, preclinical models, and later we'll talk about um, metabolic events. So if you'll take my word for it, that there are enzymes called histone deacetylases, HDACs, which are involved in this disease-related plasticity response. I'm going to completely gloss over the science here, but just tell you that there are four classes of HDACs. Class two are the good guys that prevent this to some extent. Class ones are the bad guys, one, two, three, and eight, and, and it turns out one and two are the really bad guys that promote this, uh, this response. And it turns out there are small molecule inhibitors, including a few that are FDA approved for cancer, that allow us in a translational sense to manipulate this biology. So with this context, I'd like to illustrate an example of myocardial plasticity. If you take a heart and you expose it to thoracic aortic constriction, where you, uh, in a very regimented way, narrow the aortic arch such that afterload is increased by about 60 millimeters of mercury, the heart will grow. This is a mouse heart. It will grow about, in, in terms of uh, the whole heart mass milligrams per gram, about 40% or so. And animals are exposed to a molecule called TSA, which is a non-selective inhibitor of these HDACs. Nothing happens under resting conditions but rather the growth response is cut in about half. These are old data published a long time ago, uh, cut in about half, suggesting that some of that pathological growth response is HDAC dependent and some of it is not. If you look at the LV alone, you can see similarly about half of that growth response is, uh, is HDAC dependent. Uh, I'm not showing you this, but many, many genetic approaches have, have confirmed this. And in fact, in work that uh, we did a few years ago, if you try to take that to the next level to really stress that system, to really ask the question, can these small molecules, which again, people swallow for cancer every day, can we give them the hardest job they ever saw and still see a response? So Diane Cow, a postdoctoral fellow in the lab, took animals and we engineered them to overexpress a molecule called Becklin-1. If anybody's interested, I'll be happy to tell you all about Becklin-1. Suffice it to say that it amplifies the uh, cardiomyocyte autophagic response. And in so doing, if you express it just in heart cells alone, in myocytes alone, the heart grows a great deal more. So 10 weeks of tank, the hearts are absolutely enormous. So that's the hardest job an HDAC inhibitor would ever see. And Diane asked, what if I did that same paradigm and I treated them with an HDAC inhibitor um, at the same time in parallel? And in fact, she found that that, that pathological growth response was substan substantially suppressed. <clears throat> and these data are, are uh, quantified here. You can see that this growth response under wild-type conditions is greatly amplified when these animals overexpress and, and amplify their autophagic response. And in both cases, the HDAC inhibitor brought it right back down to the same level. Again, we see a little bit of growth um, that is HDAC independent. But this amplified growth response was completely aborted uh, by this small molecule. Now, Diane is a cardiologist, and of course she knows very well, as everyone in the room does, that we're not always able to prevent disease, but rather often patients will present after disease has already developed, they have structural and functional changes, and we try to slow that down, arrest it, or maybe possibly even reverse it. And so she did the converse experiment, which was a reversal experiment. So she took animals in another experiment, and these, oops, these same, um, these same transgenics, Suffice it to say that an LV of a mouse is around 65 milligrams, and the percent fractional shortening, of course, a measure of contractile performance, is around 70. So that's a normal heart. Now, here's a plastic response. Three, 10 weeks of TAC, and the LV grows threefold, increases in mass threefold, and LV function declines. So imagine, this is when the patient comes to your clinic with left ventricular hypertrophy LV systolic dysfunction and symptoms. What happens if you treat them with an HDAC inhibitor then when they have structural disease and the disease-related stress, in other words, the surgical constriction is still in place? 
She found that over the next four weeks, LV mass began to return back toward normal. LV function began to improve. If she took it out for another four weeks, she found that LV function returned virtually back to normal. LV mass continued to decline. This increment of mass that persists to some extent is the fibrotic change uh, that it, too is quite plastic but with much slower kinetics. So that right there is one of the most dramatic examples that I've seen in my career of myocardioplasticity where the LV mass of a mouse can increase threefold and in the setting of persistent stress, if you pull the, the, the uh, rug out from under that, those molecular mechanisms, LV mass begins to re improve and LV function returns back toward normal. Okay, my, my circle didn't get right there either. So <clears throat> another example of, of uh, plasticity, the myocardium focuses on metabolic stress. The metabolic stress of our society nowadays, as I'll illustrate, stems, as I'm sure you're all aware, from robust and dramatic deteriorations in lifestyle around our world. Um, here are the, the seven healthy patterns of lifestyle. And you can see, that. Take, take my word for it, that red or yellow is bad, and I don't have to convince you that um, the way in which our society um, interacts with lifestyle, uh, diet, physical activity, cholesterol, and so forth, uh, is, is suboptimal. And in fact, it's been illustrated in some ways that uh, the future of the human race uh, is changing. In fact, as someone who has lived in Texas now for more than a decade, I, I can assure you that we, uh, <laughs> we do some of this ourselves. <clears throat> so this is 1985 in the United States of America where the rates of obesity are plotted. This is not overweight, this is obesity, a BMI greater than 30. Now, <clears throat> you can see the, the white states are the states where we have no data. We don't know with no data there. But the states where we have data include a variety of states where obesity rates are less than 10%, and in some of the states, obesity rates are 10 to 14%. That's 1985, 86, 87, 88, 89, 90, 1990. We have data in most of the states, and you can see that we have some in the West where obesity rates are less than 10%. We have a robust uh, subsection here uh, where obesity rates are 10 to 14%. That was in five years. 91, 92, 93, 94, 95. By 1995, we have data in all the states, and we have no states that have an obesity rate less than 10%. We have several states that have obesity rates 10 to 14 percent, and we have quite a few here in the middle with obesity rates are now 15 to 19 percent. 96, 97, 98, 99, 2000. By the year 2000, no states with less than 10 percent. There's only one state, Colorado, 10 to 14. States in the West are 15 to 19, and you can see now we have states that are emerging unbelievably with obesity rates of 20 to 24 percent. That's in 15 years. 2001, two, three, four. By 2005, we have no states less than 10, no states 10 to 14, just a few states 15 to 19, and you can see now we even are starting to see unbelievably some states that have obesity rates greater than 30 percent. Unbelievable in 20 years. Now I could stop there or we could do five more years. If you Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. By 2010, there's no more blue on the map. The best we can do is obesity rates of 20 to 24 percent, 25 to 29 percent, and, and greater than 30 percent. Spectacular changes over the course of 25 years. The, the, the population of the United States has changed. The face of our nation has changed in, in, this, in this regard. And it's not just us. So these are obesity rates between 1980 and 2008 in men and women, and you can see that in North America, we arguably lead the way, but you can see that worldwide and, in fact, everywhere on the planet, these obesity trends have emerged. I will tell you that in, uh, in the United States, the prevalence of obesity is 11%. In China, where the population is 1.4 billion people, the prevalence of, of, of diabetes is also 11%. The number of people in China who have pre-diabetes is estimated at 50%. 700 million people have pre-diabetes. It turns out that in Asians, the trigger point, the BMI threshold at which you're prone to, to uh, diabetes 
is lower than it is in Caucasians. That's well accepted. Nobody has the first idea why. The genetic reason why, uh, if you're a, a Chinese person carrying 20 pounds, may not is enough to trigger you to be prone to diabetes. Where in a Caucasian, it takes more than that. It's it's an absolute puzzle that has not been solved. Um, but it illustrates that, in my view, as we start to talk a little bit about the future that uh, diabetic heart disease is going to be an explosion, an epidemic, a pandemic, literally around the world. So let's talk about the future. So my friend and mentor, Dr. Braunwall, said the thrombocardiologist of the 20th century will be replaced by the diabetocardiologist of the 21st. And I really think, I really think that's right. Many of you in the room here who are experts in thrombotic heart disease have made spectacular advances over the last 30, 30 years, as we've seen. Now the problem has morphed into something entirely new, and that is diabetes-associated heart disease. And I believe, again, in my opinion, in the next 10 or 20 years, we're going to see an, a, a, an explosion of that. So let's talk about science again. I'll show you another example of plasticity. Again, the, these are in, pre, in mouse preclinical models. We set out to study a, a group of uh, transcription factors called FOXO, 4 kid box o containing uh, transcription factors. Suffice it to say that FOXO, these are molecules that are expressed at high level in cardiac myocytes, and prior to this, nothing was known about what they do. However, it is known that in other cell types, like in hepatocytes, these guys are capable of rendering the cell diabetic insulin resistant. So these molecules, at least in hepatocytes, seem to have some role in the pathophysiology of diabetes. So given that we knew that, and given that these, the changes that, are, that occur in the diabetic myocyte, FOXO is known to do some of those things, we set out to explore the role of diabetic cardiomyopathy. Now I will tell you that patients with diabetes, the model that we have is that they have three hits on their heart. Often those patients have atherosclerotic disease, hence they are sometimes ischemic. Typically those patients have hypertension, hence they have elevated afterload. But in addition, the milieu of the, of the diabetic individual is quite potentially at least toxic to the cardiac myocyte. There are many things that are occurring, uh, signaling molecules, uh, adrenergic activation, renin angiotensin system. Uh, uh, fluctuations in insulin and so forth, all of these th things impinging on the myocyte, and as I'll show you, is quite toxic to the myocyte. So this poor myocyte is potentially being suff suffering from three different hits, and we set out to explore the role of whether or not FOXO might be doing something there. First of all, I will tell you that it's well known that FOXO lives at the end of the insulin signaling cascade. So when insulin binds to the insulin receptor, it signals to the IRS1 molecule, insulin receptor substrate, PI3 kinase, all the way down. And when, that, when insulin knocks on the door, the cell responds by sending the glucose transporter to the cell surface to bring in glucose. Insulin binds, and the cell responds by bringing in glucose. It turns out it's also well known at the end of that cascade, the uh, AKT, a kinase here, phosphorylates FOXO, which shoots it out into the nucleus where it's inactive. A transcription factor in the cytoplasm is in inactive. So we had set out, um, I'm telescoping a lot of information here, but we began to ask the question, could FOXO be playing some role in this? So let's make a FOXO that lives in the nucleus and does, just sits there and turns on genes. What does that do? And I will tell you then work we published a few years, some years ago now, that in fact it renders the myocyte in fact insulin resistant. It is in fact capable of making that myocyte essentially diabetic. Now that's an incredibly artificial circumstance where we're putting this, this uh, molecule into the cell and forcing it to stay in the nucleus. But suffice it to say that when that happens, at least under that artificial circumstance, the cell does in fact uh, become diabetic. So then uh, we then ask the subsequent question, okay, it's possible that it does this under artificial circumstances. What if we take an animal and we give it diabetes? Let's see what FOXO is doing. So we took two models of type two diabetes, one a high fat diet model and another a leptin receptor deficient mouse, both of which are models of type two diabetes. And sure enough, we found both FOXO1 and FOXO3 were in the nucleus more than they were under chow conditions, same thing. In the, uh, in the genetic mutants. FOXO at least is in, the, is in the nucleus, and in fact, it's turning on a lot of genes. So FOXO is in fact in the nucleus, driving a bunch of genes in, the, in these models of, of diabetes. 
So then we asked the question, okay, does it have any functional relevance? And to do that, we tracked animals by echo serially over six months. And when we do that, um, in our hands, when the percent fractional shortening drops below uh, 40%, the animals have a syndrome consistent with heart failure. And so in the animals that were wild type, in other words, these are wild type mice who are just exposed to a high fat diet. This right here, by the way, corresponds to a Big Mac, large fries, and large Coke. So straight for six months you can see that the contractile performance of the heart declines significantly. As a control, we do those in animals that overexpress a transgene called mercury mirror. I'll tell you more about that, but that's just a control. We found the same thing. However, if we knock out both FOXO1 and FOXO3 in the cardiac myocytes before we expose them to the high-fat diet, we found a, a remarkable attenuation of this decline in systolic performance. Uh, suggesting to us that FOXOs, the one and three, are in fact required for this cardiomyopathic response. In fact, what happens if we only inactivate FOXO1 by itself? We found the same thing. We found that FOXO1 was capable of, that sil silencing of FOXO1 is capable of preventing this uh, diabetic cardiomyopathic phenotype, suggesting pretty strongly that FOXO in the cardiac myocyte is in fact playing a role uh, when the myocyte is responding to this, these toxic uh, influences all around it. Those, um, those functional data are corroborated here structurally. You can see that the, heart, the robust growth of the heart is attenuated when you knock out FOXO1. Uh, fetal genes, which are bad things when they turn on, are, are attenuated. Um, the, uh, hypertrophic response of the myocytes themselves, again, is blunted. So many things of this, again, this plasticity, that, whoops, this, this plasticity response, plasticity response um, is attenuated when you knock out FOXO going into the, the disease. Many other things, including, for example, um, you, the, uh, I told you that on a high-fat diet, the cell becomes uh, insulin resistant. It can't handle glucose. And in fact, uh, if you do uh, PET scanning it with 18 fluorodeoxyglucose, you can see that the heart is in fact a robust utilizer of glucose. And in fact, in the diabetic hearts, the cells can't take up glucose. They're unable to use glucose in, this, in the setting of, uh, of diabetes quantified here. However, if you knock out FOXO, that, that response is completely abrogated. The cells are continued to be able to handle glucose normally. Um, just briefly, the gene, if the cell um, can't handle glucose, the cells that metabolize, uh, the, the enzymes that metabolize glucose go down, makes sense, uh, but those changes are attenuated here. Now the mycite, as I'm sure you well know, um, metabolizes substrate constantly. It has to either eat fatty acids or glucose, that's what it prefers, fatty acids or glucose, sometimes amino acids and other things. But the myocyte gas tank only holds enough ATP for five heartbeats. So if it stopped metabolizing, you'd have five heartbeats and it would stop. So it's constantly eating, and if it can't handle glucose, if the cell can't take in glucose, it takes in fatty acids, and in fact, it engorges itself on fatty acids, uh, and the enzymes that are involved in fatty acid metabolism go up in diabetes, and again, that response was similarly attenuated. As a result of that, the cells fill up with, lip, with lipid. You can see this red staining here is, is a steatosis in the cardiac myocyte. And if you knock out FOXO, that response is attenuated. In the liver, for example, where we didn't make any changes, we didn't know genetic manipulations here, um, that response is uh, persistent. Another way of measuring that is to measure triglycerides. And you can see the triglycerides in the heart go way up in the setting of type 2 diabetes, and that is attenuated um, as shown there. OK, here's the plasticity response. Now, I hope you're thinking, well, that's fine enough to, to blunt that or prevent that, but can you reverse that? So we did that experiment, and these are data that are not yet published. But what we did was we took animals, again, on this six months of a high-fat diet, but halfway into it, we exposed them to a molecule, tamoxifen, if you'll take my word for it, triggers this recombination response. So the cells are, are genetically normal until they're exposed to several doses of tamoxifen, and then FOXO is silenced at that point. So if we take those animals, the animals, uh, and the same sort of paradigm here, the animals that are exposed to chow, no matter what their genotypes are, whether the alleles are flocks, the mercury mirror, or this combination where we silence FOXO, you can see on chow diet, the hearts are perfectly normal. As we had seen before now, in the animals that are exposed to a high-fat diet in the three different genotypes, you can see that, again, there's this decline in contractile performance in this control, 
Same thing here. What happens in this context where we are in fact capable, you know, all the uh, pieces are in place, where we could in fact silence Foxo, what happens at that point? Again, and I will tell you that that is another, one of the most dramatic examples I've seen of myocardioplasticity, where in the setting of continued high fat diet exposure, if you inactivate si Foxo at that point, the heart recovers uh, robustly. I will tell you, if you knock out FOXO3 at that same point, there's essentially no, no recovery. So it really is FOXO1 that appears to be the bad actor there. And again, those data are corroborated structurally, where you can see that the myocytes hypertrophy, and they go back down, at the, uh, down again. The heart grows and shrinks again. The, uh, the, this is fibrosis. The fibrotic response is also quite plastic. It's, it's so important to remember that myocardial fibrosis is not like leather that's just laid down. It, in fact, is quite plastic as well as it is in many other organs. And, in fact, the, the loss of the ability to metabolize glucose is recoverable. So many, many aspects of this disease-related phenotype are completely plastic and can return right back to normal when the disease-related stress uh, is, is attacked um, at a molecular level. And finally, um, the, the steatosis of the myocytes is similarly attenuated over time. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about what at least I think uh, lies in the future. I've already told you that I think that diabetic heart disease is, is coming at us like a tsunami of, of, of heart disease. Another area that we haven't talked much about today, of course, is HEFPEF. And as, as all of you are aware, um, somewhere around 50% of patients who present with a clinical syndrome of heart failure, in fact, have a preserved ejection fraction. And now there is uh, some discussion uh, about perhaps an intermediate phenotype uh, between those two. All of you know these numbers. That the, the numbers are absolutely staggering in terms of the number of people who have HEFPEF, and that prevalence is, is worsening. And as you're aware, all of the studies that have, have uh, tested um, drugs that have been effective in, HEF, in HEFREF have been, in fact, neutral in HEFPEF. So, in fact, we have no uh, evidence-based therapies with the possible exception, uh, depending on how you, how you interpret the TopCat trial of, of mineralocorticoid antagonists. So here is, is an enormous problem for which we have no evidence-based therapies. And many of us believe the reason for that is because, it, in fact, it is a, first, it's a poorly phenotyped uh, syndrome to start with, but it also is a multi-organ system related issue that um, that is difficult to pin down, and I, and I can tell you that I think the definition of HEFPEF has not been formalized across thought leaders in this area such that it, it is uh, both in the preclinical space and clinically, I think, something that uh, needs, needs far additional work. And, and in fact, we, we are working on this uh, in my lab as, as well. <clears throat> Another thing that I predict is that heart disease will spread from the developed world well into the developing world. Again, th these are data that if the way things are going now look, the uh, heart disease, which used to be a disease of the developed world, will, will spread everywhere. And I can tell you from at the level of circulation, that's one of the reasons that uh, we have three editors in Asia. I've been to, to China three times this year already. We're trying to get out in front of this problem in Asia because uh, hundreds of millions of people uh, are, are at risk for developing these diseases. Finally, another thing that I think we as a community don't focus on enough is the fact that the, the ways in which um, our, our, uh, the diseases we care for are candidly bankrupting our society, especially in the United States where, where healthcare is so fragmented. Um, it's estimated that now, uh, I read the other day that it, the um, healthcare expenditures relative to GDP just hit the 18% mark uh, recently. Um, I also read that if you took health care of the United States and just pulled it out of our economy, it would be the fifth largest economy in the world, just our health care segment of our economy. And I think we as, a, we as a community have an obligation to recognize this and at least think about this and strategize way in which we, we can contribute to this problem. Because if you add up heart conditions and hypertension, stroke and so forth, and call that cardiovascular disease, you can see it's, it's way out in front of everybody else. The costs are growing um, and, and amplified by the indirect costs. For example, the fact that you're no longer able to work, you're not contributing to society, uh, and so forth, that the costs are, are, are amplifying. Another prediction is the prospect of uh, precision medicine, phenotyping all these different patients with heart failure of all, all sorts, uh, not just HEFREF and HEFPEF, but we have a syndrome that affects hundreds of millions of people, and yet 
um, the genetic basis for these uh, is, is very much poorly defined. And I think there is at least the possibility, uh, not the certainty, but the possibility that some of the approaches around uh, precision medicine will, will be informative there. Here's a dramatic example of success in a different area, and that is in diabetes. The number, the number of drugs that we have to treat heart, uh, uh, hypertension is a bunch, right? It's like 12, 11. But look what's happened to the field of diabetes. It's exploded such that now there are more drugs to treat diabetes than there are to treat hypertension now. And, and all according in the last you know, 15 or, or years or so. So when, you know, when society gets focused on something the, and the resources are available, there a prodigious number of advances uh, can emerge. And I, and I would challenge all of us to, to begin to think about whether we could see something like this uh, going forward in the, in the realm of heart disease and heart failure. In this figure, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up and just point out that there are many, many things that I think Harold promised going into the future. This is, this is something I adapted from Jim and, uh, and, and Lynn Stevenson in a beautiful review they wrote in circulation just uh, a few weeks ago. Um, assist the, the heart uh, using these devices that we've talked a lot about. Replace the heart entirely. Repurpose uh, many of the, the uh, signaling events or the calcium uh, handling events, the, home, uh, the energy events. Um, modulate pathways, uh, remodeling events with uh, a variety of different strategies. Um, there's work underway uh, at our place and elsewhere uh, trying to turn, turn fibroblasts into cardiac myocytes and, and other approaches in cell-based therapies, which I think have uh, some uh, potential going forward to, uh, to improve the heart. Finally, um, this is NIH funding over the last uh, number of decades. And in a very clever study from Duke University published some years ago, um, they took those numbers and translated them 10 years into the future. The notion being that if you get a grant, the likelihood that it's going to have an impact will take at least 10 years. And in fact, if you plot the, the, uh, the rate of NIH funding versus changes in mort age-adjusted mortality, in fact, there's a remarkable uh, lineup of, the, of those findings, suggesting that, in fact, much of what the NIH and NHLBI is funding, in fact, does over time translate into improvements in cardiovascular mortality. Now, the future is, uh, is complicated. It's not what it used to be. But many things I think that we face are the challenges of lifestyle that I've illustrated. Um, the uh, genetic basis of disease, big data and precision medicine, regenerative medicine, aging, bridging disciplines, the developing world, and of course the environment. The solution to this, I argue, is research, it's, and including the, the rate in which we, we spend uh, on healthcare. The only way that we're going to be able to afford to deal with the diabetes that is, that is impinging upon us is by understanding underlying mechanisms and turning off the spigot. Uh, that's easily as true, if not more true, for neuroscience. Some people think that that cognitive disorders like Alzheimer's will and bankrupt our society unless we find ways to, to uh, stop this at its core, at its root, rather than just dealing with the problem as it, um, as it appears before us. So those are my thoughts, and with that, I'll, I'll stop and be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Joe. That was uh, really remarkable. So I'll start with uh, the last uh, cartoon that uh, you showed with the healthcare delivery and uh, the federal obsession uh, about developing uh, more and more efficient and lean ways to do healthcare delivery. And you nicely showed that the root of the problem is probably where we need uh, to focus on. And you also showed some work. Uh, uh, nicely showing that we have ways to get remarkable improvements and you show the plasticity results in your work. So my question is, uh, given your uh, role uh, leading one of the uh, top divisions of cardiology in the country and now leading uh, the official journal of, of our society, the American Heart Association Society, do you think that there's any contradiction in how the NIH is uh, deciding on where to allocate the funds. Do you think that uh, the, the, the healthcare delivery, uh, the allocation of funds between the healthcare delivery research versus the root of the problem is appropriate? Do you see any, any challenges there on who is making these decisions and where we're going? 
Well, every time I get a grant rejected, I surely think that they're not, they're not <laughs> directing their money correctly. That's where it's coming from. Um, you know, the, I don't have the exact numbers, but the NHLBI budget is, I think, a third of the NCI budget, something like the National Cancer Institute. Um, there, people have done studies where you uh, evaluate the rate at which society is spending on research for a given disease versus the impact of that disease. And I can tell you that two that are on the short end of the stick are cardiovascular disease and diabetes, where we spend far less on them research-wise than the outsized impact they have on society. Now, contrast that with other examples. Um, I'm, I'm not here to suggest that we shouldn't be doing research on all sorts of diseases, but the one that's at the other end of that spectrum is breast cancer, where uh, a, a far greater proportion of research funds are devoted to breast cancer than the actual impact of that, that disease. Now, I, I, I don't know why that is. The um, arguably breast cancer, which strikes a woman in her 40s, no fault of hers, um, is something that society reacts to differently than to heart disease because people perceive that, you know, you went to McDonald's too many times in your life or, or you wouldn't give up your cigarettes. And there's, there's truth to some of that. Of course, there's a huge genetic component and a societal component as well. But, you know, if, if you, you know, the way in which the NHLBI distributes money, you know, you, you can quibble with here and there. But if you step back and look at how society addresses these problems, I can tell you it at least is not proportionate to the, to the societal impact of those diseases. Neil. So, Joe, great, great, great talk. And I want to take us back a little bit because the circle that you show us that is the obvious circle, more obesity, more diabetes, more diabetes, more heart failure. However, and we discussed it in length in the past, heart failure by itself is a cause of diabetes. There is mounting amount of evidence that when you have heart failure, then the, there is a cascade of things that create the downregulation of the GLUT4 and the development of diabetes. The question, do you know if there is any information, what happened to the FOXO when you treat heart failure and you get the reverse remodeling, for example, as a result from acute setting of heart failure unloading or chronic heart failure unloading? Yeah, so the idea that heart failure causes diabetes is one that I had never heard until you mentioned it to me over dinner. <laughs> and, and um, you know, we're still waiting for your submission to circulation on that, so. Uh, <laughs> you would get it after the flight. Okay, fine. <laughs> but in other data that I haven't shown you, we asked the question, if FOXO really is such a bad actor, then it ought to be active early. And so we've put animals on a high-fat diet, and within one week, FOXO is already up to mischief in the nucleus after one week. Mm. So, uh, you know, there's potential there that, uh, you know, it is a response that clearly is plastic and clearly is reversible. Uh, and so we've not, we've not done the question of, you know, if we have unloaded the hearts and to see what FOXO does there. So I had a quick question. Um, so one of, the, one of the perspectives I wanted to hear from you also, you know, get your thoughts on is around the warfare with heart failure and the approaches of uh, devices versus drugs. And, you know, as you very well know, the expenditure around drug-based therapy versus the expenditure around device-based therapy, such as LVADs, where do you see that going in the next, you know, decade? Do you think that uh, there will come a time when, uh, you know, we have more cyborgs walking around with partial mechanical hearts uh, for the heart failure population, or do you think this is a, a druggable target uh, where drugs uh, targeting FOXO, for example, will surpass the need for uh, mechanical devices? <clears throat> Well, I obviously believe that there, there, there are potential ways to target molecular events in the, in the, in the disease affecting my site. And I can tell you that I showed you two examples of some of the most striking plastic responses I've ever, I've ever witnessed. Um, I, I will tell you that there are people, including something that's coming out in circulation in the next few weeks, that people argue that we are perhaps too quick to put in advices, that, um, that you know, if you, if you make the analogy to, uh, to atherosclerotic disease and angina, uh, you know, rather than trying to treat the patient medically, we just slam a stent in there and we're, qu we're quick to move to a, a mechanical approach. And there are people I have heard say things like, you know, we put them on 6.25 twice a day in core, I can call it, call it a day, and, and if they still have symptoms, then, then we put a device in or something. And that at least there's some people out there who believe that more 
assiduous attention to really optimizing medical therapy is something that maybe has, has lost a little focus. Yeah, I think that's a really, that's a really critical point, uh, especially for this audience, because you know, while we're talking about myocardial recovery, you know, once you're on an LVAD, the likelihood of coming off that LVAD uh, is pretty small. And so the timing of when you actually uh, you know, put in an LVAD is so critical. And like you said, I think that there are a lot of times where we put in an LVAD early, there's not really an intermediate option, or we, are, we fully maximize uh, drug therapy before we get to that point. Yeah, you've committed yourself to a path at that yeah. point. Dr. Hill, that yeah. was a wonderful presentation, and you know, kind of to connect to the device question is, what I, I don't see often talked about is the connection of drugs and devices. Mm -hmm. As you say, some of the, our patients are going to be with devices for many, many years, and perhaps we should be looking at drug therapy to keep them healthy on the device. And then I was somewhat surprised, somewhat not so surprised to not see anything about stem cells, and maybe we're over that hump, but if you can make maybe a comment on it. Uh, I would appreciate it. <clears throat> uh, absolutely. So, um, you know, I think there's a lot of, the first part, there's a lot of potential for a combination of mechanical therapies and, and uh, targeted molecular therapies for sure. And, uh, and obviously I'm myself, my own lab, putting a lot of effort into that space. The stem cell area is interesting in that with few exceptions, um, the notion of cardiac stem cells is essentially dead. There are few people who a small number of people who disagree with me on that, but um, in the great majority of instances, when the myocardium is capable of regenerating, it's not some stem cell or some progenitor cell, although there are little pockets of progenitor cells, it's rather cardiac myocytes who suddenly remember how to divide. And so that is where the focus is. Um, how do we take a cardiac myocyte, which within the first you know, few months of human life decides I will never divide again, and how do we trick them into dividing again? And there's a lot of work uh, focused on that. There have been a lot of cell-based therapies, as you're aware, with every kind of cell you can think of, from the bone marrow, from adipose tissue, uh, and so forth. And with rare exception, what they do, those cells go in there. If you look a week later, they're gone. They definitely don't turn into cardiac myocytes. But the fact that they passed through there does something a little bit good for the heart. The, Consistently, the EF goes up two or three or four points. Usually, the myocytes are gone. And so now the thinking in the field is that there's some paracrine event that they, they went in there, sat there for a few hours, elicited some kind of response, and that was good for the heart. So right now, the, the cutting edge questions is, what, what is that paracrine mediator, and what is that response? Is it an angiogenic response? Is it an anti-inflammatory response? Nobody knows, but those are sort of the cutting edge questions. But with, with a few exceptions, the notion that there is a stem cell that you can inject into the heart, uh, with the exception of iPS cells, you know, iPS cells are cells where you, um, you take fibroblasts and you turn them into stem cells, and then you turn around and make them into whatever cell you want. Those probably have potential, but they, they are way far away from clinical utility because they, they can, they, the risk of teratoma all over the place is, is enormous. So the field of myocardial regeneration is active and exciting, but it, it's not stem cells anymore. It's, it's either turning cardiac myocytes on or taking the neighboring fibroblast and turning it into a, into a myocyte. Bill, thank you. Uh, that's a very good perspective, both philosophical and Medical. A quick comment on Uriel's uh, statement. There are a couple of papers on post LVAD decrease of insulin requirement, both from our center and other places, and I think that's, a, that's an interesting observation overall. Uh, but a, a more um, a philosophical question, or maybe more of regulations the economic burden, the heart failure being so much in the context of uh, impact on the economy of the country. We're talking more about practicing metric-driven medicine. I mean, I call it metric medicine. You're thinking about readmission rate, mortality. You're losing the perspective of an individual patient. And we're either sending people home from the ER because we're worried about readmission or tucking them into observation units. How do you foresee shifting that strategy towards funding more of research than penalizing and trying to practice medicine on the metric level? Well, I, it's a good question. I'm not sure I have the answer, but I, I believe part of the answer is for all of us in this room to get more engaged with the problem that, you know, that we are, 
you know, when, when we sit in front of Epic, we're spending somebody else's money, right? Every time we hit it, we hit an order. And, you know, if we can't begin to control that ourselves, we, the content experts, society is going to do that for us. That's why, you know, the CMS, you know, in the United States, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services is, you know, running around making all these rules about, you know, when you can do an echo and how much you're going to get for it and so forth, because we've done a, a poor job of controlling ourselves and then and then saying you know to our regulatory leaders that you know what more of these resources ought to be directed at the source of the problem which are the molecular mechanisms because if we're going to we're chasing our tails by going after dealing with the problem after it develops in a you know an elderly person so i, I think i guess my call to arms for the room here is that we each one of us has to get more engaged with delivering that message to uh you know to our legislative leaders and so forth so if there are no more questions, I think we will continue the program and thank Dr. Hill.